You got here right on time. I appreciate punctuality. My name is Wendy Richmond, owner of this mansion. I have summoned you, dear investigator, to help us solve a mystery which has recently come back to haunt us. Part of the answer lies in the past, at the time father built our home. By assisting him in the construction, you will witness events of our family's history during the Victorian era. Oh, I was young and silly then, and very much in love. You must hurry, though, to build the mansion, because the true mystery awaits for you inside. Good luck, and watch carefully for the clues. So we meet again after 30 years. Welcome to Richmond Mansion. I'm afraid time has left its inescapable mark upon me and that past tragedies have tamed my once vibrant spirit. Oh well. Feel free to move about the place as you wish and listen well to what my guests have to say. Past and present meet here to provide answers to many mysteries. Oh, and tea is at four o'clock sharp. The drawing room. In a Victorian house, this serves the same function as what we now call the living room. Before television, before radio, it is in this room that families entertain themselves and guests by reading aloud, singing, or putting on little plays and puppet shows. In England, girls were homeschooled, and the drawing room is where they learned the skills that their society expected them to master. Writing, playing a musical instrument, drawing, hence the name, and so forth. The walls are either wallpapered or painted in lighter colors, chiefly yellows and greens. The room usually contains a number of cushioned chairs, small tables with statuettes, and a table piano in a corner. That piano always reminds me of William. I was the one who found him, you know, right where he had proposed to my sister. They were meeting up there secretly. I remember the pink shade his skin had taken because of the cyanide he put in his tea to commit suicide. No one found the poisoned flask, only the spoon. Who is that, Charles? That's William Slater, a schoolmate of mine, my first American friend. His father is George Slater, the industrialist. I hear he's very rich. Maybe he could finance father's toy store. Oh, you must ask him, Charles. Good evening. I'm William Slater. I'm Wendy, Charles' sister. What wonderful music you were playing. Was that Beethoven? Oh, Chopin. Etude number three. dining room. This is a dark, severe room dominated by the very large oak dining table. The walls are papered in dark colors. Around the room are several family portraits, perhaps painted by a talented family member. Dinner in a Victorian house, at least the well-to-do households, was often a rather formal affair, and the atmosphere of the room reflects this. For God's sakes, these are the 1920s. Why couldn't he stay in my room? Margaret prepared a perfectly suitable room for him in the attic. The attic? You know it's haunted. Margaret saw the ghost in the turret again last night. Why do you need to make everyone's life so miserable? In Victorian times, smoking was strictly a masculine prerogative. 
women rarely smoked, and mostly tolerated the habit as something men do. Nevertheless, smoking was subject to many social rules, particularly indoors, hence the smoking room, where men would retire after meals to indulge in their taste for cigarettes, cigars, and port. This room was often decorated in the Turkish style, with garish carpets, tapestries, and full Mediterranean paraphernalia. Smokers would don special clothes, a smoking jacket and a smoking cap, which looked not unlike a fez. These were to prevent the smell of tobacco from getting into the gentlemen's hair and suits. This, of course, would have been unforgivably uncouth. I can't believe I have to sleep in the attic. That old witch has us all on a leash. Her father left her everything, you know, and nothing for poor old Charlie. He patented some kind of wooden puzzle, and the thing really caught on at the start of the century. Well, what's important is Elizabeth will inherit it all. Now, don't read too much into that. Yes, I saw that ghost again last night. It appears mostly in the attic. I don't like it at all. That's where my bedroom happens to be. I certainly hope it's not a violent ghost. Oh, Frederick is working in the garden again today. He would protect me, I'm sure. What are you doing here, sneaking around in Father's workroom? What's that you're holding? I remember that toy from long ago. Wait a minute. Let me look at your face again. The Workshop it is in this room that Nigel Richmond created his wooden puzzle. But Victorian toys in general were varied, elaborate, and exquisitely crafted. Well-to-do Victorian children delighted in highly detailed dolls' houses with wooden furnishings such as miniature pianos, library sets covered with leather, tiny porcelain tea sets, and miniature clocks that chimed. Also extremely popular were mechanical walking toys. Their carved and painted wooden casing housed a wind-up mechanism which, when activated, caused the toy to move in surprisingly complex ways. The presence of a wine cellar in an American house of the 1920s was a serious criminal offense. At midnight, on Friday, January 16, 1920, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was enacted, and a nationwide ban on all drinking alcohol went into effect. This was the start of a 13-year period called the Prohibition. Within two weeks, truckloads of illegal alcohol started pouring across the largely unguarded borders with Canada and Mexico. And within six months, thousands of covert drinking establishments called speakeasies opened. The prohibition created a huge demand for liquor, which made the fortune of less scrupulous individuals, such as gangsters Al Capone and Lucky Luciano. you. Well, you caught me. 
Please don't tell father. He gets very angry when he knows I've had a drink. <laughs> he hurts me. You know what's ironic? I started to drink because he hurt me, telling me I would grow up to be unfaithful and cold to him like mom was. Well, sometimes the ones you hurt can hurt you back. master's bedroom. Obviously, the most important element in this room is the bed. Although at the beginning of the Victorian era, four poster beds were the norm, by the 1860s, fashion favored the French bed. A large wooden or metal bed without any posts, but with a metal pole jutting from the wall above, over which a length of fabric was draped. As the century wore on, metal beds became more and more popular. Note how the light fixture is wrapped in a thin white length of fabric. Such bagging of lights was to prevent insects to fly into the fixture and die there, leaving unsightly specks. Oh, I'm sorry. You startled me. I shouldn't be reading this, I know, but I couldn't help myself. I found it in the secret compartment in the back of the cabinet. While cleaning. It's a love letter from Harriet Richmond to William Slater. She passed away ten years ago. Charles threatened to poison himself for years, but never found the courage for it. One thing is sure, she did not marry Charles Richmond out of love. What is it, Harriet? Why have you been so cold to me lately? I can't take it anymore. Tell me. I think I'm in love with someone else. I'm sorry, Charles. The, the engagement and all. Who? I know who, don't I, Harriet? It's William, isn't it? Well, you won't have him. That I promise you. I won't lose you to him. Widespread use of wallpaper started in the latter half of the 19th century when industrialization made possible the manufacturing of high quality wallpaper at an affordable price. By the end of the century, it was one of the most popular method of home decoration for family houses. By modern standards, most Victorian wallpaper patterns are rather gaudy. They positively overflow with wreaths, leaves and floral designs. The two styles most often used are architectural paper, printed to represent elements such as balustrades and columns, and scenic paper, printed to depict landscape, historical or mythological scenes. She always has to have it her way. And when she doesn't, she threatens to cut me out of her will. 
Now she wants James out of my life. I could not bear for him to leave me. Oh, I wish Wendy would just disappear. The fireplace. All major rooms have their own fireplace. It is built into the wall and closed by two metal doors decorated with wreaths and leaves designs. The mantel is often made of oak with columns on each side and a large rectangular mirror in the uppermost panel. The mantelpiece is used to display framed pictures or photographs, dried flowers, miniature clocks, statuettes and other decorative objects. Victorians often put dried flowers and clocks under a globe, as can be seen in this famous illustration by Sir John Tenniel for Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. I just had the darndest dream last night. It was William trying to tell me something. He showed me a cup of tea and warned me about the past spilling into the present. And when I woke up, I could swear I saw him standing right in front of me, right there. <laughs> oh, it was probably my dream spilling into reality. Why couldn't she budge? You see my old magic lantern? I used to put on shows for the entire family. Harriet hated it. She wanted me to have a real job. Well, I could have if only Wendy had let me use some of Father's money to finance my film. I would have been up there with Miliers and Chaplin. Charles, now that we're engaged, you must get a real job. I hear they're looking for steel workers now that the strike is settled. Harriet, I will have a real job. You remember that magic lantern show I put on the other night? You know, the tricks I did, like putting in several plates at once and then making them move to make the little dog dance? There is a new kind of magic lantern now that can project people in movement. There's a fortune to be made in finding special ways to create effects with these plates. I don't believe it. Magic lantern shows are for entertainment. There's no money to be made in entertainment. You should have more sense like William. I hear he started to work at his father's factory. Now he'll make a good living, that man. Special. This lad is up to no good, I can tell you. Elizabeth must come to her senses or I will have to act. He's only after her money. 
Well, if she won't leave him, she won't get the money, and you can wager he will leave her as soon as the will is changed. Few objects are quite as representative of the Victorian era as the Victorian clock. Coming in a multitude of solidly carved forms made of walnut, oak, or mahogany, precisely crafted clocks chimed, pinged, and gonged on the hour all across the empire. There were wall clocks for the writing room, shelf clocks for the bedroom and kitchen, and imposing grandfather clocks in the hallway. Victorian clocks announced the hour with a simple chime or a complex rendition of the God Save the Queen. Even the telling of time was a patriotic act to a subject of the crown. Astronomy attracted its share of Victorian amateurs since all that was needed was money to buy a home telescope. Many members of the upper classes improvised themselves astronomers, and night after night, in the turret of their mansion, they would scan the sky for unknown celestial bodies and evidence of life on the moon and on Mars. Unearthly life was a hugely popular subject during the Victorian era. Even Percival Lowell, the celebrated American astronomer, speculated that the lines on the surface of Mars were canals, part of an irrigation system designed by an ancient extraterrestrial race. Lowell later redeemed himself by paving the way for the discovery of the planet Pluto. up on the ghosts maybe carry on I'll leave you to your investigation while I go down to the kitchen to prepare the tea Join us in the dining room for tea. Well, here we go. I've just come back from my walk. It's a beautiful day outside. I'll bring Elizabeth's cup. Good. Hot tea. I must find Wendy. Where is Wendy? I must speak to her. James is always so thoughtful. But I won't need two. What am I doing with two cups? Oh, where is everyone? A oh, nice afternoon break from my uh, gardening.
Oh, God. What happened to Frederick? He's dead. I remember the pink color on William's body as if it was yesterday. Frederick's body had the same color. So it must be the same poison that killed them both. Well, unless someone else here has cyanide handy, it can only come from the flask I stole when William died. And that second cup, I placed mine on the staircase and was offered one by James, I remember. When I realized I had two, I had brought one back to the kitchen, but which one? What should I do? What should I do? The poison, where is it? Somebody, come quick! Something terrible has happened. to kill Frederick. No one, I guess. Unless he drank a cup which was meant for someone else. Who? There was only one cup left, and I drank just before he did. Could it have been meant for me? Oh, dear. Oh, dear, I need to sit down. Gardener Frederick. <laughs> he brought me flowers from time to time. I think he fancied me. Oh dear, could it be my fault? Something in the teacup before I poured the tea? Oh no. Maybe the entire pot was poisoned and we're all going to die. there is the hope that we will pay up once this is all over. Hey, do you mind? This is a private conversation. to follow your wishes, but it's been so hard. It's tearing Charles and me apart. Could he have tried to poison me, Father? Could he? Well, there are some things which are better left unknown. Thank you. 
Would you look at that? White powder. Faint almond smell. I think I've just discovered what killed our poor gardener. Cyanide in the tea. This is the first time I've come upstairs since this morning. Anyway, I'm glad to know you've decided not to talk. You will get your share when the time comes. about it, of course, because of the way she treats us all. But to go out and do it? That would take years of frustration slowly seeping and... Could father have done it? I know they fought about the money again yesterday and... and about that ghost! gone. Someone stole the flask from this room just before tea time. But who could it have been? Uh, not James. He was downstairs all afternoon. Even went out for a walk. But all the others were up here at one time or another. But who was it? Who? Richmond had really been the target of that awful murder. I couldn't bear to see her die. I suspect that ghost I've been seeing of late has something to do with the poison. Could it be some sort of revenge? If so, for what? though it was so long ago. You're the one who caused all this trouble. Had you not been there, none of this would have been necessary. So stop pointing at me, sir, because you're the guilty one. Don't cry like that. It makes things harder. I can't control it. I never stop to think that you might not share the feelings that I have for you. And now Charles hates me too. You both hate me. I don't hate you, Harriet. But I love Wendy. We're getting married next month. How can you be so cruel to me? Mocking me with your marriage to Wendy? How can I fall in love with, with the monster that you are? Rejecting my love, ridiculing me. You, you 
to have hurt me in the worst way that you could ever hurt someone. I will retaliate. Do you really think I was the target, Peg? It seems almost impossible that someone would hate me so much. Do you remember when I used to brush your hair and tell you all my secrets? It seems so far away now. I guess I grew more distant with time. Oh, Peg, I love him so much. He's so handsome and such a gentleman. When we're married, we'll start a new life far away from here. We'll build our own house and we'll organize soirees. He'll play the piano, something by Chopin, and I'll entertain the guests. Maybe Charles will come to visit and put together one of his magic lantern shows. Oh, what a life we'll have. There is no reason to deny anything. It was my mistake to underestimate you. Yes, I murdered William when I was but a young lady in Wendy's care. I was terrified that she would leave James and me as my parents had done the year before. My father was a chemist and taught me all about poisons. I stole the cyanide flask from his shop. I told William that Wendy was waiting in the turret served him poison tea, and then made it look like a suicide. Charles had recognized me as Peg's brother. I stole the flask from the writing room by using the secret passage that connects it to the lobby. I didn't know he already had a cup and had chosen to return the one I gave him. Then Charles blackmailed us for a part of Wendy's money. And how would you have taken my money? Elizabeth will inherit it. And who would believe that your beloved maid would have started to resent you so much? That her heart was crushed when you were so cold and hard with her after William's death. Oh, and that she was looking forward to killing you and then killing your niece. This madness will stop now. Oh, Wendy. I've watched you as the years passed. Watched as time wrapped your innocence inside a hard and cold shell. I won't be able to watch you anymore. My time here is done. Oh, William. I loved you so deeply. Destiny has chosen to give us this brief moment together. In return for the years it has stolen from us. Thank you. 